do that this morning and you'll listen to him, not to yourself. But if you'll listen to him, I believe that the Lord will bless you this morning. We're in the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians chapter 4. Chapter 4 is packed with a lot of verses of scripture that is very influential to you here this morning. Verse number 4 talks about rejoicing to the Lord always. And verse number 6 talks about your anxiety and how God can give you peace to overcome that. Verse number 13 tells us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Verse number 19 talks about the Lord supplying all of our needs. So this is a wonderful chapter in the Word of God, which I'll be honest with you, all of them are. And uh, some of them are just a little bit more bitter to swallow. But nonetheless, they're still good because it's God's Word. But we're going to look at a verse of Scripture here this morning. And... Uh, be obedient unto the Lord, and I hope that it will speak to your soul and to your heart as it's done to mine. And uh, as the song said, he's still working on me. Amen. He's still working on me. So we'll begin our reading in verse number one of uh, Philippians chapter four. Found your place where you stand with us. Thank you. Philippians chapter four, begin our reading in verse number one. The Bible says, therefore, my beloved my dearly, my brethren, Father, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Eodius and I beseech uh, Sintichi that they may be of the same mind in the Lord. I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, Help those women who are labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with others, fellow, my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Our Father, we praise you for this morning. I thank you for everything that's been done. Thank you for conditioning the hearts already. Thank you so much, Lord, for speaking to our souls. As we are seeking your face one more time, it's the favor that we stand in need of. Lord, the mercy we're asking that you are granted on this day. Lord, I pray that we will not come here today, Lord, to tickle no ears. Lord, we won't be no sounding brass, no tinkling cymbal. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, that we'll be a trumpet, Lord, that sounds of a certainty. And Lord, the people will hear what thus saith the Lord. I pray that Jason will be removed out of the equation. And Lord Jesus, you'll be high and lifted up. Father, thank you for everyone that is here. Lord, I'm so glad that you ordained this day. And we praise your holy and wonderful name for what you you're going to do. Lord, I thank you again for what you've already done, saving souls. Lord, working in the lives, I pray that you would bless in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. Now, as we see here, church, in the introduction of this chapter here, the Apostle Paul is addressing the church. And he's addressing the church here, and he's giving some things that's upon his heart. And notice he exhorts the Philippian church, and he uh, exhorts the Philippian church in a way that is still applicable and applies to us as born-again believers here in the New Testament Baptist church. Now, Paul was unashamed of the church. He was unashamed to express his his love and his desire for the church. Now, may I say this right here? God forbid that we be ashamed of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, preacher, you don't understand what they've done to me. You don't understand the life that they're living. You don't understand the choices that they're making and so forth. May I ask you this right here? Do you understand all the choices you've made as well? Amen. May we never be ashamed of the brothers and sisters in Christ. He's showing and expressing his affection to the whole assembly. Because why? He calls them dearly beloved. He calls them brethren there to every single person. And I may I say this as well. He goes on and he says, I long to be with you. He's expressing his heart. He says, I love the church and I want to be with you. Say, so why does he want to be with them there? Because he's locked up in jail now for preaching the gospel. He's in a Roman jail cell and here he says my heart's desire is to be with you to impart some blessings upon you to be a blessing to you because you are a blessing to me I want to say this hallelujah there's no people like God's people Amen, hallelujah. And I appreciate God's people and I love them, hallelujah. I hope you do as well. Now notice he goes on and he says that they're the crown of my joy. He said, you are the crown of my joy there. And what is he talking about? The Bible tells us that there's going to be a day of reckoning for every believer, for every child of God. We shall stand before our Savior. We will give an account of our service, hallelujah, but not our sins. I just got to say it, praise God, because it's under the blood of Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. But we will give an account. And on that 
that day, the Lord Jesus Christ will hand out crowns unto those believers, those faithful stewards, those ones that labor in the Lord, those ones that do particular things, and especially the crown of rejoicing, which is the soul winner's crown. For that individual, for that person who has a burden and doesn't lose that burden, for souls that are dying and going to hell. Here we see there the crown of his joy there. Why? Because he had the opportunity. And you read it over there in the book of Acts. He led them to Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm not going to go over there with that Philippian jailer man. He was going to kill himself. And Paul said, do thyself no harm. Is that what he said? He said, don't do yourself any harm. Hallelujah. And he jumps in and he tells him, he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so shall your house. Hallelujah. I'm glad that God still saves old sinners. Amen. Hey, we see there the crown of is rejoicing, but also I want you to notice this as well. In verse number two, there was a little bit of division going on in the church, and it was between two women there. It was between Eodius there and Sintyche, and, and Sintyche and, and, and Eodius. They had not the same mind. Now, some will say, preacher, you tell me a woman and another woman that had the same mind. That's not what he's talking about. It's not talking about personalities there, so don't get that confused. Amen. And I'll say this, men, you show me another man that has the same personality as you as well. And if we do, we're in trouble. Amen, hallelujah. Now, hey, he's talking about the same mind. The mind of who? The mind of Jesus Christ. Having the mind of the Lord. That should be every believer's heart's desire is to be Christ-like and to be Christ-minded there. But we see that there were two women. They were not in agreement for whatever it may be and whatever it was around there. They were not handling things in the mind of Christ. So there's a little bit of division going on in the church and he compels those two ladies, hey, make it right. Right. Can I just say this right here? In the grand scheme of it all, church, in the grand scheme of life in God's plan, boy, how we let petty things divide us. You are to say amen there, preacher. You're exactly right. I know I'm right on that. And it's a shame. Hey, can I say this right here? The Word of God, having the mind of Christ, should unite us together. And though you may have a priest, you may have a preference there, that's okay. I still love you. But if you're going against the precepts of Christ Jesus, then you and I do not have the same mind. Amen. Now we see this now, and I'm just hurrying up, I promise you, I am going as fast as I can. I want to turn your attention now, if I can, to verse number three. This verse, I believe, is not preached on enough, and it needs to be. We talk about how anxiety, the Lord takes away anxiety. We talk about how the Lord will give us the strength to do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. We talk about how God will supply all your needs, and these are wonderful things. But in verse number three, the last eight words here in this verse, I want to draw your attention to. The Bible says in these last eight words, whose names are in the book of life whose names are in the book of life. With the Lord's help, we're going to talk about that this morning, the book of life. Amen. The book of life. Now, I want you to know this right here, my beloved, that there's coming a day and there's coming a great and glorious day over there in the book of Revelations. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20 on that day. I'm going to read it. Why? Because you need to hear it. Praise God. Oh, preacher, you're getting long-winded on us. That's all right. Hey, it's God's word. It's good. Praise God. Hey, the Bible says this in verse number 11, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, whose face the face of the earth that and heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, the small, the great stand before God and the books were open and another book was open which was what church? The book of life. And the, de the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in them and death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the sake of death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Hey, the Bible tells you and I, and the Bible tells us that God has ordained a book that's been written before the foundations of the world and it contains every single name of every man, of every woman, every boy, no matter who you are, if you've been born into this world, it has your name in it. And there's coming a great day that that book will be open and the book of life will be open there and be open before your very very highs. And the Bible says that whosoever name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Amen. 
Oh, my dear friend, it's a dreadful day. Can I just stop right there and say this right here? It's a dreadful day when that transpires and that takes place. Where the thousands, maybe millions of souls that had the opportunity time and time again, sitting on a church pew, hearing the good news, hearing the wonderful songs being sung that we heard this morning. Countless times you had opportunities to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. On this day, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're looking that book and your name will not be found. On this day, your name will not be found. And the Bible says, according to that day, they'll be cast into the lake of fire. I ask you this right here, child of God. May I say this to you this morning? Do you have a burden for souls? Are you really concerned about those on this great day? You now, it's wonderful to stand up and say, happy am I, Jesus is mine forever. It's wonderful to say, blessed and sure is Jesus is mine. It's wonderful to know that you're saved. But how about your neighbor? How about your loved ones? How about your friends? What about that co-worker you spend? eight hours and 12 hours a day on that day when they stand before Jesus Christ and their name's not found in the book of life and they're cast into the lake of fire. Do you have a burden for that soul? Oh, we become so secluded today. We become so secluded. It's all about me, myself, and I. You know, the Bible tells us in the last days men shall be what? Lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. Oh, in the last days, the church itself will fall into that apostasy and apathy. God forbid, child of God, that you have gotten to that place. God forbid, can't you see it? Do you believe the holy word of God? Can you not see this day transpire right there before your heart and your mind? I've seen countless souls cast into the lake of fire because they rejected Jesus. They rejected the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I say, preacher, why do you believe that God had wrote a book? Do you believe that he needs a book? Does he need that book to bring back remembrance of the man of man and woman? No, he doesn't need that book. But I will tell you what I, why I believe God has written this book here and given a book. Number one is to condemn the world. It's to condemn the world and to show every single person, every single person on that day, when they stand before Jesus Christ, your name could have been there, but you chose not. Your name could have been there, but you chose not. I believe as well that this book is there to what? To comfort the saints of God. To comfort those that had the assurance and knowing that your name is in a book that heaven and earth could pass away, but it's settled in heaven. Why? On this day here in Revelation chapter 20, we see that God opens it. Amen. No man's not going to steal that book there. Can I say this as well about this book? There's going to be no mistaken identity in this book either. You hear me? I know there may be some people that have your name. They may have your full name. They may have your last name, first name, middle name. You might share the same name. But my dear friend, you don't share the same DNA. Matter of fact, can I say this? When you see over there when Lazarus died and Jesus came to the grave, we often say this here, that Jesus said, Lazarus come forth. Because if he'd have said, hey, you that are dead come forth, then he'd have brought everybody that had died. He called him out by name. But don't you think, don't you think that others that died before Lazarus had the name of Lazarus? Oh, yes. You mark it down. Just like there are so many Johns. Amen. So many Jimmys. Oh, yes. So many little Susies, right? Amen. Hey, people bear the same name, but not the same DNA. What are you saying here, preacher? You might have the same name, but you don't have the same soul. Amen. Every individual soul is known by their name and God knows every single one of you. There's going to be no mistaking of identity on, in this book here. If your name is in there and it's been redeemed, it's been in there, praise God, then God knows that you're there. But also, I want to say this on this now. Listen, I'm talking about the book of life here. I'm talking about the book of life. Some will mistake it and try to combine the doctrine of predestination and salvation because of the book of life. They said, well, preacher, this book was written before the foundation of the world. So that means that everybody that God wants to save is written in this book. So they've been predestined, whether they like it or not, they're going to be saved. My dear friend, that's not what this book is about. And that's not what the Bible teaches about salvation. Salvation is for all. The Lord's not slack that any should perish. No, the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. It's already been quoted, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Salvation is the doctrine for every single person because every single person is lost. The doctrine of predestination is for those that have been saved. Amen. 
Now say, preacher, you want to talk about that? We can talk about that a little bit more, but not this morning. But I promise you, dear friend, you study that out and you'll find out that predestination is for every single one of us over in Ephesians chapter one, hallelujah, that we have been predestined to do what? Bring glory and honor and praise unto God our Father. Listen now, we see this here in this book, the Lamb's Book of Life. The day that is approaching and is coming and it's coming very quick there. And the Bible says that there were names. Notice in verse number three. It said their names were called out. You had Iodius there. You had Syntyche there. You had Clement there. There are three women. Their names were called out in the Lamb's Book of Life. In the Book of Life there, their name was there. Now, some of you may be saying, well, preacher, how do I get my name in that book? Well, I might say something that's disturbing this morning, but I'm going to phrase it in this way. It's not how you can get your name in that book. It's how you can keep your name in that book. Amen. Say, so what are you saying there, preacher? That sounds kind of contradicting there. Well, the moment you were born into this world, the day that you were born, your name is in the book. Say, so, oh, preacher, hold tight now. You're, you're, you're talking blasphemy. Well, you hold tight with me, okay? The day you were born, your name was put in that book. And how can I make such a statement there? You study out the doctrine of mercy. The doctrine of mercy, every child that is born into this world, even the stillborn children that are born into this world are under the mercy of God. God allows that child to do what? Enter into his very presence. Oh, preacher, how dare you preach such a thing as that? How dare I not say such a thing as that? For the Bible tells us that a child, when he's born into this world, is born in it there. They are not guilty. They have no understanding and they cannot come and have the ability to understand faith and to understand the gospel that Jesus Christ came from God, was sent to earth, lived among men, lived a sinless life. He died on the cross because of my sins there. And a child does not come to that knowledge and that understanding there. They're underneath the mercy of God. Say, give me scripture on that. I'll be glad to do so. You read over there and it's a wonderful one. But it's a very sad statement. It's a very sad time. In the time of King David's life, y'all know the story when he committed adultery there with Bathsheba. The Bible says that Bathsheba had a child and bore a child unto David. And the Bible says the child died. The child died. David made this statement here now. He said, the child is now dead. And this comes out of 2 uh, Samuel chapter 12, verse number 23. And now is he dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not come to me. He shall not return unto me. And innocency, what we've become familiar with in the terminology is the age of accountability. How many times have you ever heard that? The age of accountability. Children. What age number that is, I don't know because I'm not God. But I do know this right here. When a child comes to that realization, friend, you as moms and dads, you better take this serious. You better pray earnestly. When they come to that place and they start talking about sin, they're talking about Jesus. They're talking about salvation. They're talking about there's only one way to get into heaven. They're coming to an understanding. They're coming to faith is what they're coming to. They're believing the word of God. Moms and dads, you tread lightly in raising your children up. God forbid you do that. It's their soul. I don't know the age. I'm not going to put a number on it. Some like to do that. But my dear friend, God, he's no respecter of persons. He'll save them at the youngest of age as possible. Amen. But I'm telling you this right here, dear friend. When a child is born into this world, their name is put in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life, in the Book of Life. They're blameless. They're innocent. They're, their conscience hasn't come to a reality and understanding that there is a God in heaven that will save them by the grace of God. Their understanding has not developed now to keep your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. What must I do? You must be righteous. You must be righteous. Oh, preacher, that's very easy. I can be righteous. I can be a good person. Oh, I can do good. And my dear friend, that's the worst thing that man's ever said of his mouth. I can be good. I can do good. The Bible tells us difference about your righteousness and my righteousness. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us over in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 9. Hey, what does it say? It says, your heart is desperately wicked. He said, no man knoweth it. And Jesus said, out of the heart, the abundance of the mouth speaking, out of the heart. He said, hey, matter of fact, Jesus even said this right here about the heart of man there. He said, their hearts are so wicked there that some will even honor me with their lips but their heart's far from me. See, your heart's so desperately wicked, you don't even know. You don't even know it. What do you need? What do you need? You need God. 
I need God. We need the Holy Spirit of God to open up our understanding of who we are and where we are with God. Isaiah 64 tells us about our righteousness is what? It's his filthy rags. Oh, you can be good all you want to, friend. Oh, you can. You can be good all you want to. You can give whatever you want to give. You can hand that money out in the plate there. You can give to whatever works it may be. You can give to the foreign aids all you want to. But your goodness will not get you into heaven. Good's never been good enough, friend. How do you keep your name on the plate? How do you keep your name in the book there? You got to be righteous. How do I get righteous then, preacher, if I can't do it on my own? Hallelujah, I'm telling you this here, church. You can't even live life on your own. But I've got good news, praise God. The Bible tells us this right here, that all can be made righteous by what? And say, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 4, the Bible tells us about a man by the name of Abraham. And Abraham believed God. What did he do? Believe God. He took God at his word. If you will simply do that. If you will believe God and take him at his word, at what word? At the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We've already said it. I'm going to say it again. Why? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation unto them which believe. Jesus died for you and your sins. The wrath of God was placed upon his son. The judgment of my sin was placed upon Jesus Christ. I deserve that punishment there. But Jesus took your place you got to believe that. You believe that? You believe he took the beating of God? Do you believe that he took every stripe that was laid on his back there was because of mine iniquities? Do you believe that? you got to believe that, that Jesus died for you on an old rugged cross. Hallelujah. And he was buried. Easter Sunday's coming up right now. And boy, I'm telling you this right here. When Jesus went down for him, he took care of business. Hallelujah. Say, what do you mean? When he went down there, he let the old devil know you didn't win. Hallelujah. Hey, man, you didn't win not one bit at all. You didn't defeat me. I laid down my life willingly on the cross there. And matter of fact, I've come down here to preach to you, to preach to those that are in Abraham's bosom. But wait, oh big boy, three days has come. And according to the Holy Word of God, do you realize this? That Jesus could have went down. He could have went down down there to Abraham's bosom. He could have stayed one minute and come right back up if he wanted to. Why? Because he's God. Hallelujah. But the word of God said three days. Three days he'll be in the bosom. Amen. Three days he'd be in earth there. And praise the Lord he came up on that third day victoriously. You got to believe that. Amen. You got to believe that. The Jesus, the gospel, the good news church. Hallelujah. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. He did it all for you. The Bible says salvation is by what? By grace through faith. It's repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said it best over there in John chapter 14 and verse number 6. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Can I say this? I thank God for every single one of you that work in the house of God. I do. I appreciate you greatly, but your works ain't going to get you in heaven. I appreciate the money that you give to allow God's word to continue on, but your money ain't going to get you to heaven. Oh, I don't care how good you are of an individual. You can compare your life to my life and say, Preacher, I live a better life than you. I live a holier life than you. I don't go places where you go. I don't say the things that you say. I know God's got to let me into heaven. It doesn't work that way. Oh, listen to me, friend. You can be good all you want to. You can love as many people as you want. You can forgive as many people as you want to. That's not going to let you into heaven. Jesus said, I'm the door. He said, nobody's going to come into the sheepfold but by me. There's only one way, and that's Jesus. There's only one way for righteousness to be imputed unto you, child of God, to you individual that's here today. It's through Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. I want you to know this, praise the Lord. Hey, when you stand before him on that great and grand and glorious day, boy, it's going to be a dreadful day. It's going to be an awful day when he opens up that book. And listen to me now. Your name should have been there, but you rejected it. Your name should have been there, but you rejected Jesus Christ. Oh, on that day, friend, you're going to tread upon the blood of Jesus Christ. You're going to tread upon so much evidence. You realize that what God is doing on these last days, he's proven to you and I his word is true. 
You are to say amen, church. We are interrupted and hallelujah. You're exactly right, preacher. Oh, when we see these wicked things that are going before us, and I know sometimes I'll see it, and it seems like I'm angry when I'm saying it, but I promise you, I don't like saying it. I don't even like seeing these things that's transforming before us. I mean, when we see sodomy on the rise, amen. I, I know where this is going, but when we see sodomy on the rise, the Bible says, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. When we see that on the rise, when we see what's going on over there in Ukraine and Russia, when we see the pestilence that's going on with COVID worldwide. Amen. What are you saying, preacher? It's the word of God being fulfilled. Amen. Say you believe that? Why shouldn't I? Amen. The evidence that's right there before you and you stand before Jesus. God, you didn't prove yourself to me. I go a little step further. You go over there in Romans chapter 1. I, I, I won't take time. I know some preacher, I'm ready to go. Boy, you need to come to the altar. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, the Bible says, the Bible says that God's given creation to do what? To testify that there is a God. Amen. Boy, I woke up this morning. What did you hear, preacher? I heard those wonderful birds singing on the outside. Sister Marjorie, I got to think of, boy, if the birds can sing outside, I can sing inside. Oh, I'm just saying, if the birds can sing, who gave them that voice to sing? Who do you think our God did? Amen. Hey, if that bird flies through the, through the air, who gave them the ability to fly? God did. When you look at the waters, and boy, how the, I mean, it's, they want to say this thing was a big bang and all that other jazz there, that it was a mistake and so forth. You just look at the current and the water system will prove that there's a God. Amen. Boy, I'm just saying, I can sit beside that stream of water and just hear it just run all day long. And the calmness that what it produces, who do you think made that happen? God. Oh, listen to me, friend. On that day when you stand before him, there's going to be so many evidences. Countless evidence is going to come before you. It's going to flash before you, I believe, with all my heart. And you're going to see people that God has put in your life. God will draw back this time right now in this service. That you heard the songs of God. You heard the wonderful testimonies of God. You heard the word of God. And how to be what? Saved by the grace of God. And keep your name in the book of life. And you reject it. He's going to bring it before you on that day. He'll bring it back to your heart, to your minds. I'm just trying to let you see, friend, that this is a day that's coming and there's evidence before you. There's evidence before me as well. I ask you this here. Is your name secured in the book of life? Is your name secured in the book of life? The Bible talks about over there in Psalms chapter number 9, I believe it is. Psalms maybe 104, I believe too. That the wicked, their name shall be what? Blotted out. Those that reject the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Word of God, your name could have stayed there. But it's been blotted out. It's been done away with. Who did that? You did. Who made that choice? You did. So, preacher, where's that at? Psalms chapter number 9, verse number 6. Psalms 109, verse number 18 or 15. You make the choice. See, it's a thing, and people want to debate this all day long, but I'm not going to debate it. You have a free will. Right. You make a choice today, right now. You're going to choose God, or you're going to choose yourself. You're going to choose the salvation of the Lord, or you're going to choose the sin of this life. My dear friend, make the right choice this morning. Make the right choice Say, preacher, you don't understand. I got, I, I'm so young and I got so much I want to do. You don't understand. I got a life that I want to live. And, and boy, if I do that right there, if I give my life to Jesus Christ, I won't be able to fulfill all those things. You don't understand what's at stake and it's your eternal soul. And I'm trying to open up your eyes right now. It's your eternal soul. Death is no respecter of persons either, friend. No matter how old or how young you are, you have an appointed day. But the Bible tells us that it's once appointed a man to die. After that, the judgment. The book of life will be opened. Why do you think when the Lord Jesus Christ said over there in the Gospels, He said, I will say unto them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Your name is blotted out. Blotted out of the book of life. Is that you? Is that you? Say, so, preacher, don't you understand how long I've been a member of this church? My dear friend, don't you understand how long you've been lost? Is that you? Is your name going to be blotted out? Because you chose sin over Jesus? I ask you that. 
Can you say, preacher, I know my name is secured in the book of life because there was a time in my life, there was a day in my life when Jesus came into me, came into my soul, came into my heart and saved my soul. There's a time in my life I can go back and I can trace it and I can say, hey, I put saving faith, not in me, not in my works, not in anything, not in a baptism, not in a church membership, not of money, but in Jesus and Jesus alone is my trusting in. If you can say that, then you should be in agreement with these three women that are in this chapter here, whose name, according to the Word of God, is in the book of life. I don't know if you're in agreement with these. So what are you saying here, preacher? These three women, they had some attributes, some characteristics about them. Number one, they weren't lazy in the work of God. If you're saved and you're a child of God, if you're saved, you'll want to do something for your Savior. Yeah. Hey, man, I'm just talking about the evidence. Do you have that? You want to do something for Jesus in the work of God? They were helping what? Distribute the gospel. They weren't preachers, but they were helping getting the word out. That's every person that's saved by the grace of God. Wanting others to be saved. You got, that characteristic? you got that characteristic? They had this characteristic. They were not lazy in the work of God. They were loyal unto the Lord. For why? They were fellow laborers. They were loyal unto the Lord. They were fellow laborers and yoke fellows, the Bible says here. And also they were loving the body of Christ. Loving the church. Is your name secured in the Lamb's book of life? Do you have that time and that moment? And from that time forth, your life has never been the same. That time forward, no, you hadn't been perfect. I didn't say that. I didn't say that now. But your life hadn't been the same. And boy, I'm telling you, you, you may have gone astray, but you've come back, praise God. And you're devoted to the Lord. You're loyal to Him. You're loving Him. You're loving the house of God. You're loving the work of God. You're wanting other people to be saved by the grace of God as yourself. Have you secured your name in the Lamb's book of life? There again, by trusting in Jesus Christ. There's an old hymn I'd like for us to start singing here at the church. Oh, Daniel Warner, he was the writer of it. His old holiness preacher back in the 1800s. And he pinned down that wonderful hymn. My name is in the book of life. And it goes on, he says, I know that my name is there. Do you know that your name is there? Can you say it along with me? Say it along with others? Not arrogantly, no, my dear friend. Not beating our chest and saying, we're, beating our chest and saying that we're something when we're nothing. We are. But boy, to say with assurance in your soul, I know that my name is written there. Oh, I'm so glad, hallelujah. Do you have that assurance? Do you know Jesus? Do you? Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, this hour right now, I pray, Lord, we are in need more than ever. You. Lord, we ask that the Spirit of God please touch every heart of every person. Lord, I... I'm begging of you now, Lord, that you will convict greatly the one, oh Lord, that has been playing around for so long. Lord, that's been toying with the ideas. Lord, have been pushing you off for so long. Lord, they're trying to be a better person when they need to be born again. Lord, they're trying to do good deeds to please mom and dad. Lord, they're going to be saved by the grace of God. Lord, they're trying, oh Lord, to look righteous in the eyes of man and never been regenerated through the gospel. I pray on this day, I pray right now, Lord, that they will come and be honest before you for you know them, Lord. Save their soul. God, help us as a church. Lord, that this is burnt in our heart. Help us as a church and believers. It's burnt in our souls, Lord, to see our family members stand before you on that day. To see our loved ones, oh God, stand before the throne of God and cast off into the lake of fire. Lord, may we be burdened for souls. Lord, not lo losing that, not being ashamed, oh God, not being afraid. Lord, to tell them of the good news of Jesus Christ. Bless us now, we pray. Lord, I pray every person will obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand to your feet?